a lot of you probably know that um, I'm in seminary right now, and so I'm taking this class that's really been a blessing to me uh, these uh, last few months. Um, it's on Christian spirituality, and we've been really focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit, um, because you can't have Christian sp spirituality without the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, spiritualities out there, and I'm going to call them pseudo-spiritualities. Uh, you know, you can Google it, and, you know, uh, you can look up spirituality, and a lot of different ideas will pop up, um, you know, about how you can become a spiritual person. But none of them, other than Christian spirituality, is true spirituality. And here's why. All right, because apart from Christ, we're spiritually dead. How are we going to be spiritual if we're spiritually dead apart from Christ? So only Christian spirituality is the true spirituality. Like I said, you see a lot of pseudo-spiritualities out there. A lot of people you know, want to say, oh, I'm a spiritual person. And then you kind of press them on that. And what do you mean by that? Well, when I go outside and I experience nature, you know, I, I, I commune with nature. And so, you know, I'm a very spiritual person, right? But you're missing the whole thing because who is it that created all that we see, right? God. And so if we don't have a relationship with God, I mean, that's a pseudo-spirituality, right? Uh, looking at the material that God created, right? Uh, rather than looking at the Creator Himself. Or, or, or you may, you know, ask somebody, well, what do you mean if you say you're a spiritual person? Well, you know, I really appreciate uh, listening to the classical music or going to the theater. It really moves me, right? Um, but again, uh, who was the one that uh, gave us the ability to create the arts? Well, again, that's God, right? And so without a relationship with God, those are pseudo-spiritualities. Or, and again, you, you can find all these ideas online, uh, you know, Google spirituality and, you know, you'll find a lot of psychoanalysis. You've got to look within yourself to become a spiritual person. But again, if we're looking inside of ourselves, you know, do a lot of navel gazing, again, we're missing it because who is it that created us? It's God, right? So again, it's a pseudo-spirituality that does us no good whatsoever, all right? Uh, you know, a lot of psycho mumbo-jumbo, you know, uh, or, or, you know, a lot of these Eastern religions, they promote meditation. You know, I'm going to meditate with some higher power, right? Um, but not the transcendent creator God. You know, just some higher power, I'm going to meditate and, and, and become one with the All-Father or some, you know, mumbo-jumbo like that. And, and those are all pseudo-spiritualities that will not do us a lick of good. It's only through faith in Christ that we become spiritually alive and then are filled with the Holy Spirit and then we truly have access to the transcendent creator of the universe, right? And then we can truly appreciate all the things that He's given us. You see, we can truly then appreciate nature and truly appreciate the arts for what they are, a gift from the creator, you see? All right. And so, again, this is just, you know, I'm just kind of sharing with you a little bit of some of the things that I've been thinking about uh, this semester as I've been taking this class. You know, it's just part, it's just something inside of human beings that makes us seek the transcendent. We realize that there's something missing, right? I mean, there, and this has been true from the beginning of time, that we realize that apart from relationship with God, there's just something missing inside of us. And so, you know, and, and that's where all these uh, religions, these false religions came from, right? It's because people are trying to seek, well, what is missing? You know, I feel like something's missing in my life. And, and so they, you know, start to uh, seek um, this fulfillment in all these false gods, all these false rituals, you know, to try to seek fulfillment. But again, none of them are satisfying only relationship with the Creator God through His Son Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit do we truly become spiritually alive and then we can truly have that fulfillment, that, that sense of longing that we are, that's ingrained in all of us is going to be finally fulfilled, but only through relationship with God. So uh, anyway, um, you know, this is just a couple of things that I've been thinking about. And so what I want to do in the next couple of services is I want to focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. 
So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in drawing us to faith in Jesus. And then, once we have put our faith in Jesus, Sunday morning what we're going to look at is how the Holy Spirit causes us to grow in our relationship with God, to grow in spiritual maturity. So we're going to be focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in first drawing us to Christ, which we'll look at tonight, and then Sunday morning we'll look at how the Holy Spirit works as we grow in our relationship with Christ. So tonight, what we're going to be looking at, if you want to go and turn there with me, we're going to be going to several passages of Scripture. Uh, We're going to be looking at kind of a tough passage of Scripture, but I think it's going to become very clear once we uh, dive in and kind of dig a little deeper and then take it in context of all of Scripture. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 31 and 32. Now, um, some of you, well, I guess the third phase guys aren't in here, are they? Are there any second phase guys that were uh, with me when we went through the book of Mark? Okay, yeah, so now some of what y'all have heard to, uh, in, in uh, Monday Night Chapel, when we went, when we came into Mark chapter 3, we came to the same exact passage, and so you're, you're going to hear a couple of things that we talked about uh, when we went through that, but hey, it's always good to hear it again, right? So we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 31. Before we jump in, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come into your house and just uh, thank you. Uh, for all that you've done for us so that we can have relationship with you through your son Jesus and be filled with your Holy Spirit, made spiritually alive so that 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 longing, that emptiness that we felt apart from you is now fulfilled in relationship with you. And we just thank you and praise you that you desired relationship with us and that you sent your Holy Spirit to draw us to yourself. And we just thank you and praise you for that. I pray that everything that's said will glorify you this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so let's just jump right in and read these two verses in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 31. So it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Now, again, this is a tough passage of Scripture. You know, people have probably heard this passage of Scripture. And what's the first thing that comes to our mind when we read this passage of Scripture? Oh no, what is this sin, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that's not going to be forgiven, right? That's the first thing that comes to our mind. But, but here's the thing, we need to slow down just a second. Because before we jump, immediately to start wondering, well, what is this sin against the Holy Spirit, this this unforgivable sin, this this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Before we get to that, let's take it in the order that Jesus teaches it. Okay? Because Jesus says something very important before He even talks about this sin against the Holy Spirit, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see tonight, let me just go ahead and give you a a broad overview. We're going to see two things. We're going to see... The surprisingness of forgiveness. The surprise of forgiveness. And then we're going to see, secondly, the necessity of repentance. So those are my two points right there. The surprise of forgiveness and the necessity of repentance. Okay? So the first point. Now again, like I said, let me just, before we jump in, let me just say this. If Jesus would have never said this, if Jesus would have never said that there's some sin, a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven, even if he hadn't said that, people would be wondering, is there something so bad, right? Can I do something that is so bad that God can't forgive it, right? You know, and that, that would be, that's a natural human response, especially when we start to, you know, hear about that there is a God and that we're in rebellion against him, that we're fallen in our nature, that we have a fallen sin nature. You know, that's just one of our natural responses to say, is there a sin that's so bad that even God can't forgive it. Have I just gone off the rails so bad? Have I lived a lifestyle that is that is so reprehensible that even God can't forgive it? And I think there's people out there right now that actually believe that. You know, even if they don't know this passage of Scripture, they may think, you know, I have been such a terrible person that God can never forgive me. All right, but let's slow down a second and let's see what Jesus says in these two passages of Scripture. In these two verses, there's actually two clauses. So what I want to do is I want to focus first on the first thing that Jesus says in both verses. 
So let's look back at verse 31. And let's look, look at the first clause of verse 31. And then the first clause of verse 32. It says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. And this, in the first clause of verse 32, look at what it says. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. So what's Jesus saying there? He's saying that every sin, He says every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Right? He says then in verse 32, anyone who even speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Jesus is affirming that every sin, every sin is forgivable. Right? Every single sin, no matter how reprehensible, no matter how terrible it is, is forgivable. That's the first thing that Jesus says. Now, what makes this so surprising is that, look at verse 32. It says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Now, where does Jesus refers to himself? If you've read the Gospels, you know that Jesus refers to himself quite often as the Son of Man. Right? If you're familiar with that, you've heard Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man. Now, where does this title come from? All right, well, I'll tell you. It comes from Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. All right, and we won't, we won't go back there, but basically what happens is Daniel has a vision. And in this vision, he sees the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, and the Father gives him all authority. So this Son of Man title is a kingly title, all right? It's a very majestic title. And Jesus is saying, I am that Son of Man who the Father, in, in this vision that Daniel had, gave all authority, right? He says, I, I am that King that has all authority in heaven and earth, right? That is descending from the clouds of heaven. And He says, so I am that Son of Man. I am the King. Now, here's the thing about it to really appreciate what Jesus is saying. He says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Now, if it's a kingly title, if it's a majestic title, you've got to understand how they treated kings in ancient times. You couldn't speak against the king in ancient times because that would mean death, immediate death. In fact, let's, take, let's think of a couple of Bible stories. All right, Is everybody familiar with the story of Esther? Right in, in the book of Esther, and if you're not familiar, you can go back and read it in just this evening. All right? It's real short, but I'll paraphrase some of what's going on. In the book of Esther, the king is wanting to kill all of the Jewish people. All right? And Esther, uh, her uncle Mordecai, says, hey, you need to go and speak to the king in, on behalf of the Jews. All right? But here's what Esther says. She says, I can't go before the king, because if I go before the king without him calling me, that's a death sentence. She can't even go before the king without him calling her, or it's a death sentence. Or unless he, he uh, you know, points the scepter at her saying, okay, I accept you, and you can now come forward. That's the only way that, that you wouldn't receive the death penalty. All right, so much less speak against the king. You couldn't even go before the king without him calling you, or else it would be the death penalty. That's the kind of high view of the king that they had. Let's think of a couple of other Bible stories, all right? Let's think of uh, the story of David and Saul. You all remember the story of David and Saul? Saul was the king at the time, right? And he was persecuting, trying to kill David for no reason. I mean, for no reason whatsoever. And so he's chasing David all over the countryside, you know, trying to kill David. And twice, David has the opportunity to kill Saul. Saul's asleep, and the other time he's using the bathroom, and both times, David's hidden, and... Saul doesn't even know that he's there. David could have easily killed him, but why does he not kill him? And this is what he says. He says, who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? The king, right? The one that God anointed as king. I'm not going to touch him. Who am I, right? So he, even though God had said, hey, David, you're going to be king, he would not touch the Lord's anointed. Now, when David was king, here's another story for you. When David was king, all right, Absalom, his son, tries to take in authority from David. And so David has to flee from Jerusalem, right? Okay, because his son's trying to, you know, overthrow uh, his dad, which is a bad situation all around. But as David is fleeing, there's this guy named, I don't know how you say his name, but Shemaiah, all right? We'll say his name is Shemaiah. 
he starts to curse David. He's like, look at you, you know, running away from your son. It's all, you know, and he starts to curse David. And the, the advisors of David were like, hey, we need to kill this guy, right? He's cursing the king. He needs to be killed. He's speaking against the king. He needs to be killed. Um, and David says, no, you know, I'm going to forgive him. And David winds up, you know, says, well, he didn't say he's going to forgive him, but he does say I'm not going to kill him, all right? But the people around him thought, hey, he's speaking against the king. He definitely deserves death. You see? Now, later on, David instructs Solomon, his son, and says, hey, you know this guy that cursed me? He really deserves death, and Solomon, you take care of it. All right, so his son takes care of it. Um, but, again, that's the kind of view they had of the king. You couldn't come before the king without, unless he called you without the death penalty. You couldn't speak against the king. All right, that was the high view they had. Well, now, here's the thing. Jesus who is saying that He is the most majestic King of kings. He's the Son of Man. All authority has been given to Him. Do you see? But now what does He say? If anyone speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven Him. He turns this whole idea of the, this, this kingly title uh, on its head. He says, if you come to Me for forgiveness it will be granted. You see? So the King of kings, the Lord of lords, says, even if you speak against me, it will be forgiven. And that's the worst thing. I mean, that would be like the worst thing. You know, you, you say, well, what's the most reprehensible thing that we could do? Well, we speak against the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Right? But he says, even that, if we come to Jesus, will be forgiven. You see, that's the good news of the gospel. And so, and we're so quick to jump right past that and start wondering what's this sin against the Holy Spirit, right? We forget the good news of the first two clauses that any sin, any blasphemy can be forgiven. Jesus is saying, if you come to me, all sin is forgivable. All sin, no matter what it is. And this is not something new. This is something that the Old Testament prophets looked forward to. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says this, and I don't know if they have, but Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verse 18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be made like wool. See, it doesn't matter the, the sin, whatever it is. And Isaiah is looking forward to this. He says, no matter what the sin, even though they're like scarlet, they're red as crimson, they'll be washed white as snow, they'll be cleansed. David also affirms this very fact in the Old Testament. This is in Psalm 25, verse 11. It says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. He, David's like, my iniquity is great. He says, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, forgive my iniquity. So David looks forward to, and you got to understand, David did not live the perfect life, right? He Committed adultery with Bathsheba. He murdered her husband. You know, but he says, because my sin is so great, forgive my sin. Psalm 32, 1 and 2, this is actually the penitent psalm. This is right after David. And this is the crazy part. This is right after David commits adultery with Bathsheba and murders Uriah. And listen to what he writes. He says this in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. He says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Does that ring any bells? Who, who else quotes that? Paul. Paul in Romans chapter 4. says, blessed is the man whose iniquity is not counted against him. Right? And so David says, you know, all sin is forgivable if we'll come to God for forgiveness. Right? And that's even in the Old Testament. You know, a lot of times I think there's a disconnect. We think, well, God was one way in the Old Testament. He's completely different in the New Testament, right? He was a harsh, you know, wrathful, vengeful God in the Old Testament, but He's a loving, caring God in the New Testament. No, no, no. God hasn't changed. God doesn't change. All right? It, through faith and through seeking forgiveness from God, it is provided because of His grace and because of His mercy, you see? Right? No matter how great the sin, if we come to Him for forgiveness, it is provided. And then we 
go to the New Testament. We look, we look forward to it, so to speak, in the Old Testament. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. We see God's forgiveness in the Old Testament of these Old Testament saints. And then we go to the New Testament. We see in John 1.29, we see John the Baptist. He looks and he sees Jesus. What does he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? So Jesus comes and through Him all sins, no matter how great, are forgiven. Now, we, we got to ask ourselves before we move on, how is this forgiveness even possible? It's only through the sacrifice of Jesus. He is that sacrificial lamb that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. He is the sacrificial lamb that shed His blood in our place. He took the penalty of sin for us, which was death and separation from God. He took the penalty in Himself on the cross so that we could then be forgiven so that we can say with confidence, all sin is forgivable. Why? Because in 1 John 2, 2, it says that Jesus died for the sin of the world. All sins. Jesus died for all sins. That's why all sin is forgivable, because Jesus took the penalty for all sin, no matter how great, in Himself and bore it on the cross. You know, I love that it's an old hymn. You may not be familiar, but my sin... Well, it's not a hymn. I think it's a song we sing now. But my sin was great. His grace was greater. Right? Yeah, my sin was great. But the blood of Jesus is greater than all of my sins. Than all sins. You see? Right? It covers our sins. So, the first thing that Jesus affirms is if we come to Him, forgiveness is available for all sin. Now, now we can, I think, address the second part. Okay? Now that we've got a, a, a clear focus, all right? Now I think we can address the second part of this passage of Scripture. And let's see what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us uh, through what Jesus says. Okay? So now let's look at the second part uh, of this passage. So the second clause in verse 31 says this But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. The second clause in verse 32 says, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, didn't we just get through saying that all sin is forgivable? On the face of it, it seems that Jesus is contradicting himself. But Jesus is the truth. And so obviously if Jesus is speaking the truth, he is the truth, then he's not contradicting himself. So we need to dig a little bit deeper and try and see what Jesus is actually trying to teach us here. All right? And I think it's pretty clear when we take this passage of Scripture in context. So let's back up a little bit. And let's read, starting in Matthew 12, starting in verse 22. Okay, so let's read, starting in verse 22. Okay, so it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God... Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So in context, what is this sin against the Holy Spirit, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, this speaking against the Holy Spirit? Well, the Pharisees are the ones that are doing this. What is the Holy Spirit doing in the verses that we just read? It says in verse 28, it says, but this is Jesus speaking, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what is the Spirit of God doing? He is bearing witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He's bearing witness that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, the miracles that Jesus performed 
are a demonstration of the fact that He is the Son of God, that He came to be the Messiah, that He is Lord. So the Holy Spirit is confirming who Jesus is. But what the Pharisees are doing is they're rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit to who Jesus is. You see, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the speaking against the Holy Spirit. Because what is the Holy Spirit doing? He is drawing people to Jesus for forgiveness. And Jesus just got through saying, anyone who comes to me will be forgiven. But the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit is to draw people to Jesus for forgiveness. But if we reject the work of the Holy Spirit in witnessing who Jesus is, they will not be drawn to Jesus for the forgiveness they just promised. You see, and that is the sin that will not be forgiven if we reject the work of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we'll never come to Christ. We'll never come to Christ for the forgiveness that is promised. You see? And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil, all right? Um, and furthermore, they were rejecting the fact that it was the Spirit of God working through Jesus, confirming that He is the Son of God. He, the Holy Spirit, is a person. And one of the things He does is He draws people to Christ. Okay? Now, let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture and just let's focus on this. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? All right, we've already seen that the Spirit of God allowed, the Spirit of God enabled Jesus to work these miracles. Now, Jesus is the Son of God. He could have done it on His own power, right? He's the Son of God. But He depended on the Holy Spirit working through Him to confirm, right, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, all right? And Jesus talks about what the Holy Spirit's role would be. Everybody turn with me uh, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And I want you all to see this. I want everybody to be clear on what the Holy Spirit does in drawing us to Christ. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. So this is Jesus speaking, and He's teaching on what the Holy Spirit will do. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Me. Of righteousness because I go to My Father. You see Me and, and you see Me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? He's convicting the world of sin. Now, why is that so important? Because people apart from Christ okay, will never come to Christ unless we first realize that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us of the fact, apart from Christ, right? for those people who are apart from Christ, the Holy Spirit convicts us of the fact that we are sinners and that we need to come to Christ for forgiveness. Right now, let's be clear, that's not His role in believers. Okay, In believers, He convinces us of our righteousness. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, in the believer, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Okay, so that's the role of the Holy Spirit in a believer. But in those who are in the world, all right, and that's just John's way of referring to people who are outside of Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict them of sin so that they will come to Christ for forgiveness. But if we don't recognize our need of a Savior, we won't ever seek salvation, right? We won't ever come to Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is drawing us to Christ, making us convinced that we are in need of a Savior. Now, there's a lot of people out there today who are like, I'm a good person, right? You know, I don't cheat on my taxes, I don't cheat on my wife, I don't beat my kids, you know, I go to work every day, and, you know, I give to charity every now and again, and, you know, I'll, I'll go to church maybe on Christmas and Easter, you know, I'm a pretty good person, right? But what the Holy Spirit does is He convinces all people, even what we might think are the good people, okay, that everyone is a sinner in need of salvation. All people, 
right? Even the good people, I'm going to you know, put air quotes around that, even the good people who think that they're not in need of salvation. The Holy Spirit convinces all people that we need to come to Christ. The Holy Spirit draws us to Jesus. You know, in 1 John 1, nine, and you can you know, write this down, but I'm, 1 John 1, nine. most of y'all probably got this committed to memory, right? It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, this is a conditional statement. It's an if-then statement. If we do this, then this will happen, right? It says, though, the condition is, if we confess our sins. That's the condition. If we confess our sins, then... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But first, we have to confess our sins. And that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to convince us that we're wrong and that we're in need of salvation. He's going to draw us into the... He's going to help us admit the fact that we need a Savior. Because, you know, that goes against the grain of human pride, doesn't it? We all want to say, I'm a good enough person, right? You know, we all want to say, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. Um... You know, and, and this is our pride, you see, but the Holy Spirit helps us to get over that pride and confess that we're a sinner. And if we do that, if we, and, and you know, this word confession, you know, we use this word, it's a churchy term, right, that we use all the time. What does confession mean? Confession just means to say the same thing as another person, all right? What the Holy Spirit is saying is that, hey, all men are sinners apart from salvation in Christ, and all people need to come to Christ. And so what, he, what he's trying to get us to do is say, hey, confess the fact that, hey, I'm lost, I'm a sinner apart from Christ, and I need to come to Him for salvation. But when we do this, the promise is that God is faithful, right? It says, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to, what? Forgive us our sin, right? So he's, he's, the Holy Spirit is, is empowering us to meet that condition. Because, you know, i got to be honest with you, Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, I don't think it's in us. I don't think it's in us to admit our faults. And I think human pride is just such that we would never seek Christ. In fact, I think Paul affirms that in Romans chapter 3. He says there's none that seeks after God. There's none that seeks after God. It's God seeking after you. It's God seeking after me by His Holy Spirit. He's drawing us to Himself, you see, because He loves us. Right? It's, we, it's not in us to seek Him. He's doing it. He's doing the work, drawing us to Himself by the Holy Spirit. But what's He saying here in Matthew? He's saying, for those people who reject the work of the Holy Spirit, right? they're not being drawn to that forgiveness that's promised in Jesus. You see? Now, let's look at another passage. Uh, Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I do want you all to turn to this one. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because I want you all to see this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse 3. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. Okay, all right, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You see, if we have the Holy Spirit, we're not going to call Jesus accursed. What were the Pharisees doing? They're saying He's accursed. That is Beelzebub. That he's doing these miracles by the prince of demons, you see? You know, they're calling Jesus a curse. So obviously they're ignoring the work of the Holy Spirit. And on the flip side of that, right, no one by the Holy Spirit can call Jesus a curse. But on the flip side of that, no one can even say that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. We'll never confirm the fact that, hey, Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. We just can't do it. Like I said, it's not in us. But the Holy Spirit is drawing us, convicting us, first of our sin and our need of a Savior, but then the fact that Jesus is Lord and He is the Savior. You see? So it's two parts, right? First convicts us of our sin and our need of a Savior and says, oh, well, here's the Savior. Jesus is it. Jesus is the Savior, you see? All right? So He convicts uh, us of our sin and our need of a Savior and says, Jesus is Savior. You know, and, and what does Paul say in Rome? We were singing about the simple gospel. There's not a simpler statement of the gospel than Romans chapter 10, verse 9. What does it say? It says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
But again, this is a conditional statement. It says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what do we just get to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? What's the requirement to even say that Jesus is Lord? The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. Right? It's only by the Holy Spirit that we can even, that we can even say right, that Jesus is Lord. Right? That we can even confirm that He is the Lord and Savior of our lives. And believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. Right? But it's only by the Holy Spirit. Now, you know what? Let's let's stop for a second. What do we mean when we say Jesus is Lord, right? What's the Holy Spirit leading us into confessing when we say that Jesus is Lord? It's an unconditional surrender to Jesus, right? To His lordship, to His leadership, to His will and desire for our lives. That's what lordship is, right? We submit. We bend the knee to Christ, and we say. You're Lord and I'm not, right? Your will be done, not my will be done, right? And as we do this by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings us to that place of confessing that Jesus is Lord, that believing in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead. But it's only through the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the Holy Spirit do? Let's let's kind of just summarize this. The Holy Spirit leads us into confession, and repentance and draws us to Christ. But that confession and repentance is necessary. It's necessary. That's what's going to bring us to Christ. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in those who are apart from God, in those who are apart from faith in Christ. Is First, we have to confess our sins and then repent. Turn away from our sins and turn towards Christ as Lord. And when we do that, the promise is that we will be forgiven. So what is then, if I could summarize this, what is this unforgivable sin, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It's basically rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit that we're sinners and that we're in need of a Savior. That, that's the only thing that could separate us from salvation. Because other than that, if you come to Christ, we just got through saying at the beginning, all sins are forgiven, right? It's only when we reject the drawing of the Holy Spirit to bring us to Christ, that, that the, then our sins can't be forgiven, you see? We can't receive that forgiveness. It's by the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm running out of time, but let me just say this. You know, uh, I, I was listening to a sermon, and he was preaching on this, and um, he was he brought out a verse in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And th- Jesus says this, He says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You know, what this pastor I was listening to, what he said, it's kind of like this. Jesus, standing at our door and knocking by His Holy Spirit, He desires to come in and fellowship with us, to have relationship with us, to forgive us of our sins. But more than just forgive us of our sins, but to have relationship with us. And he says that if we open the door, we'll, he'll come in, right, and sup with us, which is a picture of fellowship with Jesus, salvation, right? That's a beautiful picture of salvation. We have an intimate fellowship with Him. We're going to eat with Jesus. You know, I mean, just talking over a meal, right? You know, that's a uh, close personal relationship. And He is, will come in if we'll open the door. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to open the door. But there's a sense of urgency. Let's just use the metaphor that Jesus is using here. Imagine, okay, somebody's at your door knocking. You're like, you're right in the middle of your favorite episode on Netflix, and you're like, I'll get the door when this show is over. Right, you know, and, and so, and, you, so, and I'll just wait. And so you finish watching the show, and then you go to the door, and you open the door, and look around. You know, nobody's there, right? I mean, are, are they still going to be there, right? If you've waited, if you've put it off? I mean, this, we're using the same metaphor that Jesus used, right, in that verse. The Holy Spirit is knocking at our heart's door. Let's not put off responding to the Holy Spirit. Definitely let's not reject the work of the Holy Spirit in drawing us to Christ, but let's let's not put it off. And we'll say, you know, maybe later, 
right? I still got some things I want to do, you know. Uh, I'm always reminded of St. Augustine, right? One of the early church fathers, one of my favorite early church fathers. And you know what he said um, in his confessions, his, which is basically his, his uh, autobiography of how he came to Christ. You know, when he was away from Christ, you know, he was kind of a womanizer. And, and he said this, he said, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. Right? He, he said, Lord, give me chastity, but just not yet. All right? He's putting off the work of the Holy Spirit. But let's not do that. All right? Let's respond to the work of the Holy Spirit in leading us to confession and repentance, drawing us to Christ for the promise of salvation for all sins. Right? For all sins. Now, I'm going to finish up here. In conclusion, let me just say this. If you're a person who has read this passage of Scripture before and has experienced some angst and been like, whoa, have I committed this sin, right? You know, I mean, we're kind of worried about that. Just the very fact that you have a little bit of worry or angst is a sign that, hey, the Holy Spirit is still dealing with you. He hasn't given up on you, you see, right? And if you're a Christian, look, that's not the Holy Spirit, all right? That's not the Holy Spirit trying to give you worry about, oh, am I separated from Christ, all right? That's, that's the enemy, okay? If you're a Christian, all right, that's not the Holy Spirit, because that's not the role, role of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do in the Christian? He convinces us of our righteousness. He bears witness, like it says in Romans chapter 8, He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, all right? So if you're a Christian, don't even let this worry you, okay? Because the Holy Spirit is convincing, in, is convincing us of our righteousness in Christ, all right, that's the enemy coming in against a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, and this verse worries you a little bit, hey, the whole, that's the Holy Spirit. He's, convict, he's convincing you of your need of faith in Christ. He's drawing you. Why? Because He loves you. He desires relationship with you. Jesus wants to come in and fellowship with you and sup with you, you see? Right? And so the Holy Spirit is drawing you. Let's not ignore His call. So in some... The good news of the gospel is that if we come to Jesus, all sin is forgiven. 1 John 2.2 2 says that Jesus died for the sin of the world. All sin has been paid for. All we have to do is come to Him. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But repentance is necessary. And it's the Holy Spirit that allows us to confess and repent and come to Christ. And He loves us so much that He is drawing us. Let's not neglect the work of the Holy Spirit and receive that promise that's been provided on the cross of Calvary by Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank You for the good news of the Gospel. I thank You that we have been forgiven by what You've done on the cross, that it was sufficient to pay for all sin, past, present, and future. No matter how heinous we thought the sin was, it has been provided for forgiveness by You. And we thank You and praise You for that. We'll never get tired of praising You for that forgiveness, dear Lord. I just pray that if there's anyone here tonight that has not come to You for that forgiveness, I pray that through Your Word, through the Holy Spirit, that they would be drawn to You and that they would not neglect, not reject the drawing of the Holy Spirit to bring us to salvation. We thank You and praise You for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.